I'm John Banks, and I have had the distinct privilege of being the lighted man for, uh, well, actually, a little over 30 years now, since 1971, which I started to assist my father. And he began that tradition here in Steamboat Springs in uh, 1937 as a part of the Winter Carnival. The, uh, and his involvement, actually, his attraction to Steamboat was skiing. He was, uh, he was born and raised in Utah and went to school at the uh, University of Utah where he became a charter member of the Wasatch Mountain Ski Club and they skied the, uh, the terrain that's now uh, Park City, uh, Snowbird, Alta before any lifts were there and uh, <clears throat> he was attracted to Steamboat because Steamboat was one of the places that had early lifts in the country so he was over here skiing and I guess from what I understand Berthoud Pass was the first uh, area to have a rope tow in Colorado and then Steamboat and uh, about that time Steamboat Aspen and a few others but at any rate uh, Steamboat became a part of his winter circuit as far as skiing uh, early in the uh, I guess would be the 19th century <laughs> uh, but uh, and he got involved with the local activities and part of the winter carnival at that time was a uh, torchlight parade down in Halston Hill. Actually it was, uh, they followed what's known I guess as the Ridge Run and would uh, start at the top of Halston, go down the ridge and then down past the Sulphur Cave. And uh, he had always been into uh, electrical things and the uh, disadvantage with torches of course is their sparks. They're burning holes in your ski clothes and, and in those days as they still are, ski clothes were prized possessions and to burn holes in your ski clothes uh, was not desirable so everybody was always wearing their old gear but uh, he thought that perhaps he could do the same thing with electric torches which were similar to the ones that they used for the uh, aircraft directional at the air terminals, the uh, wands and uh, he taped a couple of those to his ski poles so he had electric torches that worked pretty good then he decided you know uh, we, can, we can spread lights all over so he built a simple harness that was basically buckled to his body over his clothes that uh, used uh, three volt flashlight lamps and that started the tradition as the lighted man uh, he came over and, and uh, skied down Halston Hill for the Winter Sports Club and then in 1937 it became a part of the night show and for a couple of years it wasn't as we know it now, it didn't include the fireworks, but then somebody said, you know, it really make this look great is put some Roman candles. And so he uh, had a makeshift helmet that he could attach, or actually at that time they taped him to a uh, spear or a spike that was in the center of the helmet. And uh, there are actually some pictures of that around here, I think, in the museum. But uh, they were taped on and then doused with lighter fluid, and then just before he started down the hill, uh, they were ignited. For a long time that uh, privilege was given to Ralph Selch uh, who had a distinct advantage because of his height but, uh, and he assisted my father for years and then uh, yeah, I guess it was in, in well 1970 I moved to Steamboat Springs and was living here and I lived in Steamboat from 1970 up to 1986 and uh, <clears throat> so I didn't think there was any way I was going to get out of inheriting the tradition and I was a little concerned dad was getting up uh, into his 60s and uh, it wasn't that he was uh, a wobbly skier but when you're carrying 50-60 pounds of weight uh, it tests anybody's abilities and uh, so I was beginning to cons be concerned and, and he had always uh, tried to get me involved in it and uh, at the time, I thought it when I would, when uh, I agreed to help out with the light of man, I didn't realize there were going to be two of us for the next uh, six, seven years, and uh, so we skied together on the hill from uh, '71 through I think uh, I'm not sure exactly. I think it was '77, '76, '77, somewhere in there, and uh, I know he wasn't planning on retiring. <laughs> by his actions, but he was slowed down by a uh, heart attack 
And so he decided to sit one year out and uh, decided that it was quite uh, interesting or fascinating to watch. And then after that he became the assistant commentator <laughs> for years for the uh, night show mm -hmm. and would assist the uh, announcer in telling what was going on as far as the lighted man as uh, I was coming down the hill. And then of course in 1975 there were three lighted men when my younger brother, or I should say youngest, I have two, two other brothers and a sister. I have a brother that's a year younger than I am, Ron, who's an uh, electrical engineer like myself. And then I have uh, a sister and then a younger brother, brother's ten years younger than I am, Kent. And Kent was the one that skied down the hill with uh, Dad and I. As a matter of fact, the orange suit that you have on display was the one that Kent used. <clears throat> and that was, has actually only been used once. Since it was originally when it was used. Originally, no, when it was, that was built specifically for Kent. Oh. And it was only used in 1975, and uh, then he managed to uh, not be available <laughs> for the next so several that's only years. Good, so that's why probably it's in such yeah, good condition. Yeah, it's in great condition <laughs> because, yeah, typically the lighted man suits, by the time we have uh, used them, a few seasons, they're pretty well uh, toasted. So that's so to about speak. circa 1975. Right, that okay. one would be. And then I think here in your uh, your uh, archives or storage, you I think you have one of one of his original suits, which was built on a uh, Continental Oil Company coverall, mm -hmm. and with uh, probably a few patches here and there. And then also, I think you have the one that I used, which was actually his original suit, which was leather straps, made of leather straps, strapped on. When I joined this, the Lighted Man, I revamped that one and upgraded it from the three volt uh, flashlight globes that originally was using to a 12 volt uh, Christmas tree lamp, which is no longer available. And uh, and we went through, and I don't know, I think I used that for, I don't know, about 10 years until it got to the point that it was uh, it was requiring more repair than necessary. And also we were have we couldn't replace any of the 12 volt lamps, they were no longer available and we only had a limited supply so we started looking for things that would be a little more durable and uh, came up with the, the suit that we're using now which has a uh, has a uh, little incandescent lamp that looks like an automotive fuse, it's a long cylindrical uh, tube with a metal contact on each end and then, then there are uh, wired in uh, <coughs> strings of three circuits and then they're, they're thread into a plastic tubing that's actually laced onto the suit. But what it does is it, it's flexible but it also protects the lamps from uh, snow, which was a problem before when they get hot, they tend to get uh, snowflake or uh, uh, snow from kicked up from the skis and of course they were gone and, and that was a big project was uh, replacing lamps because typically we'll do two runs. So the first thing we do on the second round, before the second round, is check all the lamps and replace all the lamps. And sometimes I lose all the lamps on my skis. Uh, so that was actually that was the first thing that we redid was we put some covers over the ski lamps or the lamps on the skis. And I'm not sure whether you may have those. Uh, a pair of um, that would be a pair of, of black head skis with a black rubber strip with lamp holders inside of it and then there were some plastic, white plastic snap-on covers that covered the lamps, protected them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that worked pretty well. And that was a great improvement actually on the equipment because the original uh, skis, the lamps, were actually on a wooden strip that was screwed down to the ski bolt to the front head of the boot and also behind the boot, which made the skis rather inflexible which uh, <laughs> of course made them a little bit more difficult to ski with. But uh, and then when we went to the uh, to the head skis and the uh, lamp bar was actually a, a flexible rubber tubing and they were the sockets were mounted and that was a big improvement. And now the ones we're using are actually in a a PVC clear PVC plastic pipe that's up on two brackets above the skis, about four inches above the skis, so it actually keeps them out of the snow. But it also allows the ski to flex and uh, act more like skis. Of course, they do such a great job with the grooming equipment at House and Hill now that it's not like it used to be when it was 
it was a skating rink right one year or no snow at all and dodging rocks and so forth but uh, uh, we have been very fortunate the last 15 years or so with the great snow conditions mm -hmm. uh, that they uh, are able to regroom just before we go which is in its outstanding um, you are um, gonna ski down house in tomorrow night in the night show is there anything that you're particularly looking forward to about this year's run versus the previous ones? Actually, uh, not really other than the fact that this year has been a little bit frustrating because we've had a new, uh, a new fireworks company supplying our fireworks and they're not completely familiar with, with uh, what we use and of course we're not, we're not quite familiar with the fireworks that they've supplied. We're not, uh, so it'll take us a, We've got to do a little bit of experimenting. We'll actually do some test burns of some of the fireworks this evening because it's the only chance we've got just to ride to get an idea of what it's going to look like. And then we've got to uh, repackage it so it works with our with our part of the show. Mm -hmm. and so it's more. There's a little bit of anxiety. In yeah. It, typically, this is something we've got done mm -hmm. early in the week. It's always our first concern because that's the, the only unknown. Mm -hmm. that we have is exactly what's the fires are going to come the way we've requested and are there going to be any substitutions and what kind of changes because the technology changes a little bit with pyrotechnics uh, and they repackage things differently and, and there's also, and particularly when you're dealing with a different uh, supplier that's not familiar with what we've used in the past, when you try to describe to them and what they envision the lighted man being, uh, it sometimes it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't all come out. Mm -hmm. We're fortunate that the, the that uh, several of the people uh, that we're working with have actually been involved with the, the fireworks here before, but they typically are more involved with the aerial show, so they don't actually get involved with what I'm doing. Other than they see what I'm using, they don't actually see it uh, displayed or the effect because they're up in the the uh, locations where they shoot the fire or the big aerial star shells which are back away from the in the general slope and the part of the show that the crowd sees so did your um <clears throat> how did the the whole theory the whole first idea of the lighted man come about you said that your your dad came here for skiing and things like that but the winter carnival was the winter carnival for many years and did not include the lighted man so how did that for, you know it's a very unique thing i don't think there's any place else in the world or the country where they have such a thing as the lighted man how did who had that first idea and how well, did that come it, together it, again I, again it, it, it evolved i think but it, it was it was my dad's contribution to the winter carnival but it's the winter carnival part of the winter carnival was the torchlight parade and i'm sure and I don't know when the uh, like the uh, the snake dance and the fiery hoop and all of that has kind of come together to build the night show. And of course, uh, uh, he's or my father had uh, worked into that very well. And I'm not sure whether he was the second part of the night show because it originally, like I say, it was just a, it was just a torchlight, a uh, bunch of guys skiing down Halson uh, as part of the winter carnival. And it probably wasn't even as a, uh, it certainly wasn't staged like the show is now where everybody goes over to House and Hill to watch it. I'm sure it was, you know, it's 7 o'clock tonight, we've got a bunch of guys that are going to be skiing down House and Hill and there were probably a few people over there, not necessarily to watch it, but to be over there to support it and probably was watched from all over town. And I think, actually, <laughs> I think a lot of the night show is still that way with a lot of the locals. Although there's, we seem to have a uh, very... Uh, a uh, bunch of uh, true enthusiasts that uh, it just isn't isn't the night show unless they're over there uh, standing up right at the bottom of the slope. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can certainly see and get a good feel for what's going on uh, anywhere that you can see House and Hill. So you think that the lighted mm -hmm. man, the actual idea of it, of getting in a suit with the fireworks coming out and, and all of that, do you think that that was really that it was your dad's idea that just that that oh, yeah. first yeah. idea yeah it definitely because that would like i say it started out with flashlights taped to ski poles and then the next idea was if you can run lights on ski poles maybe we need more lights mm -hmm. and 
and so it was lights on poles and and, and some of the and originally he used uh, they had uh, electric slalom poles that they used on the hill and we've we've kind of replaced that with our with our fireworks display that we use the stationary fireworks that we use on the hill now mm -hmm. which uh, and it was it was a problem trying to get because with each with electric slalom pole we had to have somebody there and we'd end up with uh, 15, 16 people involved in the lighted man and uh, if you can get the same guys year after year and they kind of know the routine and maybe a couple of new guys worked into it that uh, can kind of follow along it's okay but it, it was still uh, uh, pretty complicated and it was also complicated trying to keep all of that stuff working because it's batteries and testing and checking and, and that, was, that was the thing that I remember as a child when we would come over here uh, from Vernal, Utah, which is where we lived, which was home, uh, we'd come over here and spend a week in Steamboat every year for the for the night show. But we would spend that week testing stuff here, and then we we'd spend a month before that uh, evenings and uh, weekends uh, helping Dad check his equipment, go through it, test everything, and then he would uh, in the later years he after things got a, a bit more reliable. It didn't require as much test and retest, and also when we started to phase out the electric uh, slalom poles, he would he would add uh, he would do uh, displays that were uh, typically uh, uh, signs, flaming signs, uh, uh, howdy steamboat, or uh, welcome to the carnival, things like that. One year he did an American flag that was kind of cool. That was done with electric lights, so and. Uh, and then I guess one year we did the uh, he did a steamboat. It was uh, all wrapped. I mean, it was an outline wrapped in burlap, and it was actually suspended by a wire that went across the hill. And it was flamed, of course, and then it was towed across the hill with an invisible skier and a wire. And the interesting thing about it is uh, they parked it in the middle for a while. It uh, went across uh, part of the way, and then. Uh, um, it was stationary in one spot, and of course the part they didn't plan on was when you have a steel wire and it's tensioned quite tight, and then you heat it with a fire, it separates. <laughs> and so, in a great finale, the, uh, the steamboat crashed into the snow, and uh, it, was, it was, a lot of people thought it was, it was planned, but it actually wasn't. But do you know what, remember what year that was? I don't remember what year that was, but it was... Uh, Oh, I'm not sure that it that was some that was during the 70s some that part of the time when the two of us were skiing together So you were the lighted men. Yeah, we were the lighted men at that time, <laughs> we were the lighted men That's And actually the year that there were the three of us was the year that I had problems with my skis and uh, That was a, that was the year I took my first uh, tumble as a lighted man and that was the thing that had always bothered me because uh, at that time we carried all the fireworks, the Roman candles were mounted to our, a helmet and of course they stuck way up in the air and it was real, it was a balancing act, that's what it was. So falling over and, was and not good. So falling <laughs> over, I didn't, I didn't relish the thought of that, I, I had wondered in my mind, you know, if you fall over, how are you going to get up? And I wasn't sure I could do that, but uh, I started the first turn and my uh, downhill ski released. And I thought, okay, I'll finish the turn with my uphill ski because I was just shifting the weight. And uh, before we completed the turn, I mean, I was actually pointing straight down the hill. The other one released. And when my boots hit the snow, I did a nice forward roll, flip actually. And the skis came with me, everything. And I was uh, seated on the snow with the fireworks going off and the lights were still going. and. Uh, at that time, my assistant, Jamie Bunch, he was right behind me, he was the fireman, and I was the last one coming down the hill. My brother was ahead of me, and then fought and gone first. And we were, I don't know, a couple hundred feet apart. But uh, Jamie says, you want me to put the skis back on? I said, no, take them off, unplug them. And that was the thing, they had to be disconnected. And I, and I told him, I said, if they won't make it for the first turn, I'm sure they're not going to make it the rest. And so I walked right down the hill, and by the time they got to the bottom, I had pretty well caught up with them. And uh, 
right straight down the hill and uh, everybody basically thought it was part of the show and very few actually realized that I had actually taken a tumble. But uh, it actually was a big relief to me because uh, that fear of what happens if you fall, uh, what's going to happen. And uh, it, we survived quite well and then of course last year <laughs> we decided to try it again. But it was under different circumstances. We had uh, added some, some uh, some different fireworks which were actually on my poles and I have some uh, I actually have a button that's designed for fireworks on my poles but in the past we've always I always hold the poles up over my head which means I have to switch my grip and there's a, and, it, and the firing button is in position at that point but when I have the poles down which is why I was I was skiing on them last year and I wanted to shoot the fireworks down as I was skiing I couldn't find the buttons with my gloves so I had picked my one pole up and I was looking at it when I was making the turn <laughs> and I managed to uh, lose my balance and tip over and it was, uh, but I, I wasn't down long scrambled around and the, and the important thing is when, we, is when we're getting close to the crowd we want to make sure that the Roman candles are always pointed uphill and away from the crowd and that was a concern of course the the guy that was uphill was my fireman and so he was dodging the Roman candles <laughs> But uh, everybody got he, a kick out of it. He I mean, was I think unscathed. It was yeah. Not not that <clears throat> not that people were thinking like, yeah, the life man's down. But it was just more um, that just the excitement of it of the unknown. Oh, oh that absolutely. Whole unknown oh, category. I mean, it, and the thing is, I can you know the the crowd is is really interesting, and you can in the crowd you can hear them. Why? Well, and I have my helmet has a has a liner that's part of the fireproof equipment, but. Uh, and it, it really muffles sound, but I can hear the crowd. I can really hear the crowd when I come down the hill. And, and it's amazing the, what should I say, the group comments, you know, and the, oh no. <laughs> and, uh, and, but uh, we were able to get back up rather quickly. I wasn't down very long at all, and it surprised me. And, uh, and one of the things with the equipment now is all the fireworks is carried off the backpack on a rack. And they're actually cartridges that they're actually dropped on, they're not taped on or anything. They just uh, they, uh, slide down a tube and they're in bundles and we actually have, we, have, uh, we have four bundles that we actually use, two of them for each run and then each bundle is, is actually made up of two separate bundles of fireworks that are actually uh, controlled individually. So, and that part of, the, part of that is to get so that we have the effect of the Roman candles going off all the way down the hill because we can't get them that will burn for three minutes, four minutes, which is what we need. Also, it's, also you run into a problem with fireworks that will burn that long because if you start it, then what do you do for three minutes if something goes wrong? <laughs> and it, so it, it's better to have shorter burning fireworks and stage it, which is what we do now. And so, as I ski down the hill, I've got some buttons and controls on the poles. And, which, the, and that actually ignites. Which actually ignites the fireworks electrically. And then this, we have some stationary fireworks on the hill, and it's all controlled electrically. I've got two, two separate crews, two guys that are on each side of the hill, and one of them runs the, the control box, and the other one's kind of the uh, fireman, and also uh, make sure that we don't have any problem with any... Uh, of the spectators or actually some of the other participants getting tangled up in the stationary fireworks that we have set up so we can watch it and it also it's uh, one of the things we've done and it, that again it's all controlled electrically but we've also over the years have got that down to where it's uh, it's all plug and play which is as we call it it's it, we run out a cable that's a 200 foot cable and every 50 feet it's got a a plug similar to a telephone plug and then we put plug connectors on the fireworks bundles and there are typically two of them at each one of those locations and uh, they, they, they're snapped in and it's all ready to go, it's all checked electronically to make sure it's all connected and then uh, when it's ready to, ready to go the, the guy at the top of the hill and he's in communication with, with uh, Dave Herman, who's the one that stages me at the top and assists me in getting off with a radio, with his radio, and he's the one that cues them when to fire the various uh, series of fireworks as I go down, which uh, 
hopefully enhances the the uh, lighted man portion of the night show. So any, anybody short of an electrical engineer probably couldn't handle this because it sounds pretty involved. Well, I, I don't know whether you need to be an electrical engineer, but you would certainly need to have an inclination towards electrical mm -hmm. and electronics. I know my father wasn't an electrical engineer, but he certainly, uh, he certainly had uh, been fascinated by electrical things uh, from the time he was a kid. I know one of his first projects that I remember, well actually it was a long time before me, but it was actually he built a uh, vacuum tube radio when he was uh, uh, a teenager and that was back when people didn't have radios and uh, I still have the thing it's, and it's a collector's item, it really is. Actually this would be a great place to donate it. <laughs> Lighted Man's first electrical, electrical project. project. Right. That, is, that would be great. But it's, a, it's, an old, it's an old vacuum tube radio and uh, uh, he built the box and he wound the coils and uh, it's made out of square wire that's stiff and all soldered together and it, uh, it took three different kinds of batteries to run the thing. But uh, it's got, I think it's got three different tuning units on that you had to have them all tuned together in order to make things mm -hmm come in and uh, but uh, he's always he was always uh, involved with electrical things and was in had an excellent understanding of, uh, of electricity and how it functioned and that's what it would take I mean for somebody and, and that's the thing it isn't just you, you there are lots of people who would love to be the lighted man but all they want to do is put on the suit and, uh, ski. and yeah <laughs> ski and show off so to speak and but you got to take care. You got to maintain the equipment, and it's also responsibility. That was a, that was my big drawback when my father was trying to talk me into it. You know, I could see doing it once or twice, maybe, but I couldn't see a yearly, annual commitment to come back or to be available every year. It was simple when I was living here. It wasn't that big of a deal, and that mm -hmm. was kind of the thing that everybody I used to tell. You know, if I didn't be wasn't the lighted man, I would get run out of town. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that was all in, in, in good, good humor, but, but since that time, since living here, it's been, it's been a wonderful, wonderful excuse to get back to Steamboat every mm -hmm. year. And, uh, During a very special time. We enjoy too. it, and it's a neat, and it's, uh, it's right now it's, we, have a, we have a great relationship with the Winter Sports Club. I basically um, donate my time, and they take care of my expenses. So it, it's uh, sort of a symbiotic relationship. Works, works for them. Works for me, and I. It allows it to be a part of Steamboat, and it's a unique part of Steamboat. We, the Lighted Man, has appeared a lot of other places, but it's only, it's only uh, special one-time uh, shows, and and they also get they have to pick up all the expenses then, mm -hmm. which and it's uh, it takes quite a bit to maintain the equipment. But uh, I've been fortunate, and typically I use that uh, those shows to uh, to make the major purchases of the major equipment. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I start thinking about some of the things I'd like to do. But um, you can bury three or four thousand dollars in some just minor changes easily. Mm -hmm. So where are some of those appearances that you've been to? Well. My father, and I, you know, I've done some, and he did a lot of them. I mean, it's it's been done at uh, Winter Park, it's been done at Aspen, it's been done at uh, Jackson Hole. Um, and so they just want to, they just have the lighted man. That's their Sun or are they having a well, event you know, I don't event. know. Some of them, it's it's just just uh, just the lighted man. I, I mean, I used to come over and do it, did it for the World Cup several years as a special thing. A, um, let's see, um, I did it down in, in Arizona one year, um, they wanted me to do it at Squaw Valley one year, but we had a problem with getting the licensing and permits for the pyrotechnics, and it, we just couldn't get it all together in the time frame that they wanted it. But, uh, I'm trying to think where else we've been. I know, yeah, I know it's been uh, Sun Valley, Alta, uh, Park City, and then it was used to be a little skier in north of Steam or north of Vernal. And Dad used to do it. We used to do it up there every year, and it was just a lighted man thing. 
and uh, that was lots of fun. But, and that doesn't even exist anymore. It's called Grizzly Ridge. The mountain has reclaimed the ski area, <laughs> which is sad. But uh, also with good roads now, it's uh, easy for uh, those people in Vernal to uh, come over to either to the Colorado ski areas or to go to uh, the Salt Lake ski areas, and there are some wonderful ski areas. Of course, when I was a kid, we used to go up with Dad practically every weekend in the winter, and uh, we just uh, like cross-country skiing, except it was, yeah, it was actually more uh, mountaineering. We'd spend half a day climbing a mountain, and uh, and we'd spend ten minutes skiing back down. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'd do that, and Dad had some friends that uh, enjoyed doing it, and we'd get together and do that, and then he had a small ski area. Actually, it was, it was a hill with, uh, we had three rope toes on it. It was just uh, outside of town, about 15 minutes. When there was enough snow, we'd uh, have it up and running, and sometimes it was actually open to the public. But uh, we always had something to do. He skied. He liked skiing. Skiing was his thing. In the wintertime, it was skiing. In the summertime, he liked to fish. And uh, he followed skiing everywhere. Uh, he, well, everywhere it was at, when he first started. Uh, he's, yeah, I mean, Aspen was uh, one of the places. Steamboat, Steamboat though was special because Steamboat, you could always come over to Steamboat and 90% of the time the weather was perfect. It was always sunny uh, and you'd have good snow in Steamboat. And we used to, when we used to go the weekends, my brother and I and Dad, when we'd ski together, we'd kind of flip a coin to see whether we'd go to Alta or whether we'd go to Steamboat. Those were sort of our two favorite places. Alta's got the train, and it has snow, but it doesn't have the weather like Steamboat. And uh, if we didn't know exactly what the weather was, we had relatives in, in Salt Lake, so we could get a pretty good idea what was what it was going, but you didn't have to worry about Steamboat. You come over to Steamboat, and very seldom would you get uh, uh, a bad weekend. And so Steamboat was always our first choice. And then when I was young, uh, again the Winter Carnival and the Lighted Man was a wonderful opportunity to be over here every year. And uh, Steamboat always fascinated me because I had, as growing up, the only part of Steamboat I'd seen was the wintertime. So I always had it envisioned as this, uh, some kind of a place that was covered up with, uh, with mountains of snow. And that was actually one of the things that, that brought me over to Steamboat after I graduated from college. I wanted to come, I, wanted to, I always wanted to see what Steamboat was like in the summertime. And uh, Stephen Spray Mansfield, with their dance school, and my mother was a dance teacher. She'd actually been offered a position with Stephen Spray Mansfield, but uh, she would come up in the fall for the dance concert. And uh, I was home out of college, and at that particular time I wasn't, and I, had been working and then I was off work and I was uh, waiting for a, a job that uh, with Utah Power and Light, which started the first of the year. And uh, she asked me if I wanted to come over to Steamboat. Actually, if I drive her over, she wanted to come over to the concert. And I said, sure, I want to see what Steamboat's like. And uh, I got over here and uh, had a great weekend. And I met, met a few more people that I didn't know. And, uh, <laughs> ended up before the weekend was out going up and uh, talking to John Fetcher and Gordon Wren at the, at the ski area and asking if they had uh, any uh, work that needed to be done and at that particular time they were just losing all of their summer college help, headed back to school. This was in August and uh, they needed some help with the trail crew so I went to work on the trail crew and uh, the rest of it's history. Next thing I was working in the electrical department there and uh, helped with the installation of the original Bell Gondola. Worked with John Fetcher and uh, a French, uh, French electrical technician and uh, that didn't speak English and uh, it was lots of fun. By the time we got, got through with the project, it's interesting, a lot of electrical terms are universal. And we got to the point that we kind of spoke a, uh, I don't know, a pigeon French and English electronic electrical jargon that worked real well. John Fetcher uh, spoke French, and we would get together. We'd, we'd get together once a week, go over drawings and uh, and 
the progress on the electrical side of the project up at the Scandinavian Lodge, which is where uh, Jean Louis Ray was staying. That was his name. And uh, after it got to a point where it, it John, I mean, he'd walk up and we'd be, Gene and I'd be talking about doing something we were working on. And John would shake his head and he said, I don't know what you two are talking about. It's not English, it's not French. <laughs> it's electrical. <laughs> it's electrical. <laughs> but uh, it was, it was, it was real enjoyable. Enjoyed that time. And then, uh, then I ended up continuing with the ski area. And I kept thinking, you know, at some point I'm going to have to get a real job. But it, it was always challenging. We did some really neat stuff with the steamboat. Ski Corp, and uh, as at that time it was uh, owned by uh, LTV Aerospace, and they had a pretty aggressive and uh, um, progressive uh, management team, and it was because of the fact that they'd come out of the aerospace industry, and uh, they allowed us to do a lot of neat things at Steamboat. I mean, we were the the first skier in the country that had uh, a, a real comprehensive control systems on the lifts that really were tailored to minimizing downtime and maximizing the safety aspect of the equipment. We, and, uh, and it was just because they let us go out on a limb with some electrical technology that, that was brand new to the when uh, programmable controllers and microprocessors and computers were just starting to be uh, thought about we took the application and applied it to the list and steamboat and uh, and I had some good guys that I worked with. Dave was one of them, Dave Herman, which is still out there, and uh, then we, and Jamie Bunch and uh, we bit off some pretty good chunks with some commitments on getting some lifts up and running with new equipment that wasn't tested and stuff that and equipment that would still be uh, fail safe as far as from a safety aspect, so it wouldn't be dangerous to the public, but it allowed us to eliminate the, uh, what we call them unexplained stops on the lifts, which at that time were basically caused by the safety systems malfunctioning. It had gotten to the point that the, the uh, safety aspect of ski lifts, the tram board had required us to have safety switches to monitor all of the functions on the lifts, but uh, the switches themselves became as much a problem as uh, the uh, actually they became more of a problem than the actual uh, conditions they were designed to monitor. And uh, when you'd have a switch that would malfunction or a stop button that would get depressed, and there was a uh, hundred or so of them that were all any one of them could shut down the lift, and not knowing which one, uh, typically you'd spend 45 minutes looking for a and you couldn't run the lift. You couldn't guess. You couldn't bypass stuff. You had to know what the problem was. Was it actually a real safety malfunction, or was it a? Once you knew it was a malfunctioning switch, then you could monitor the the condition visually with a with, a, with an operator and run the lift. But uh, it caused us a lot of grief, and so we, with the help of the guys, we basically designed a whole new control system based with microprocessor technology and computer technology that would monitor the safety system function and remove it from being a problem and allow the switches to do what they were designed to which was to look for uh, safety hazards and monitor those and uh, yeah, but it was lots of fun we wouldn't have been able to do it without uh, the support of an aggressive management team and uh, Dave and Jamie I know we get off when we all got together and said we're gonna we're gonna do whatever it takes and when you've got three brand new lifts and you tell the lift manufacturer okay you're not supplying any of the control systems we are and this is what this is what the main drive equipment is and then we're gonna build all the rest of it and we work with contractors and and equipment suppliers and uh, testing and and we trade circuits and ideas and and spent a lot of time batting ideas back and forth before we finally got things down to things that we thought would work and uh, then putting it all together and getting it up and running on the lifts by the opening season was a challenge and we put a lot more hours in than we <laughs> we originally thought but uh, it was it was great
good. That's a nice side light. It has nothing yeah. to do with the lighted man, no, but, but it kept great. me here in Steamboat. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I worked for the ski area for 10 years. And, uh, and finally, uh, uh, I needed a change, and uh, and um, I just uh, uh, decided it was time for a change, and I went and I was back east for a while, and then I came back to Steamboat, so I still had a house here, and uh, always wanted to run a snowcat, and so I talked them into letting me work with the night crew, and that lasted about two weeks, and then they decided they wanted to do a they wanted to do a pilot snowmaking program to see if snowmaking was feasible in Steamboat. And so that was, uh, when was that, 1980, I think, somewhere around in there, 80, 81. And uh, I was working on a night crew, and so they drug me into Glenn Polk's office and said, uh, we want to do this, you interested? <laughs> and it works, and it's, you know, it, was, it would have to be done with the, with the uh, slope maintenance, and it was a nighttime project, and so we got another guy and the two of us, uh, we modified one of the snow cats to carry our snowmaking equipment around which was lots of hoses and electric lines and we had we had a trailer with pumps on it we had fire hoses because we didn't have any real stationary setup equipment so we and we were testing different types of uh, snow guns we had uh, 1200 feet of it was 1200 feet it was more than that 2500 feet of uh, lightweight pipe that we assembled up and down and we did a lot of stuff up and down Vagabond and at the top of Christie and uh, uh, the base of Thunderhead but basically to test the equipment and then the next year because of that uh, they decided to uh, um, put in a snowmaking system and I got involved in that ended up as, as uh, involved in the engineering portion of it and then uh, the first year was the director the operation of snowmaking. And then again after that I moved on and ended up working for TIC for a while and they sent me all over the western United States which I enjoyed immensely the work but uh, it, uh, it's a hectic life and then I ended up spending some time in Elko, Nevada working for a mining company or a couple of them actually and that was a spin-off from a TIC job I decided to stay over there for a while and uh, then ended up in the Northwest working for Kaiser Aluminum for a few years, worked for them for five years, and then uh, went out on my own, and I've been basically, uh, uh, since then, we've been working on a project to uh, actually utilize uh, excess agricultural waste fibers, which in primary our area is wheat straw. But, uh, and that kind of evolved from working through an environmental engineering company that I was, consulting firm that I was working with, and uh, uh, a became good friends with an individual that was a wheat farmer background and uh, we got involved with some technology that used wheat straw to uh, make building materials similar to wall panels and plywood and so forth and we've been involved with that now for uh, five or six years now working on trying to get that to come together as a, as a viable project and it has just kind of blossomed into a bunch of of interrelated projects, but what they work into is a sustainable uh, farming, or based around sustainable farming, and also produce uh, local jobs and uh, and uh, products that are that essentially will find, supply a local market, which is kind of neat mm -hmm. because uh, it and it uh, it uh, cuts down our dependence on our timber resource but it also allows us to uh, reutilize the timber resource to the, for the things that we like, more the, the furniture, the wood grains, the doors, the thing that you see the wood. We mm -hmm. don't need to make tuba floors and bury them in walls and, mm -hmm. and uh, grind up trees to make particle board when we can uh, make the same stuff out of straw, and which is actually a superior material in most applications. Well, I hope that and sounds so wonderful. So we're working on that. and. Uh, Hopefully that's all going to come together. I hope so. We haven't given up yet. That's great. And uh, but so far, I mean, it's uh, uh, and it has given me the time that I can. I've always been able to somehow manage to uh, sneak off for a week in February to come up to Steamboat to be the lighted man. And uh, the, my family's been real supportive, and now it, it's actually getting 
becoming a a family holiday or or like a family reunion as far as my brothers sisters and family we uh, try to get together during the, the week in steamboat I have family in Utah and my younger brothers down in California of course I'm up in Washington and uh, we kind of collect in steamboat every year for the second week in February. And it's, it's a known thing, <laughs> so it's easy to plan or easier to plan. Absolutely, right? yeah. I, I, I can mark it out on my calendar several years right. in advance. Right, exactly. And, uh, and then everybody else can plan on that too. And it seems to be one of the things that sort of remained the same in steamboat. Mm -hmm. uh, steamboat has definitely really blossomed as a recreation community now, and uh, which is great with the summer activities as well as the the winter activities. It was, uh, I, I know it's sure it's helped the, the retail service industry here mm -hmm. immensely. I mean, the restaurants and the uh, uh, those type of businesses that used to struggle, they would do well during the ski season, but it was so short and it was so dependent on Mother Nature. And uh, now that it's uh, it's there are other things besides skiing and there are other activities during the different seasons. It's 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 nice to come back to Steamboat and see the the downtown and and the air and the, and the ski area how the businesses are still there. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of them have been here for a long time, but and it's well, we've lost a few that have been here a long time that uh, have just uh, probably matured and uh, their usefulness is, uh, has has waned, but. Uh, it's nice to see some of them that, that have been here a long time, they're still here, and it's also s nice to see their, their competition, so there's a tremendous variety. And that was one of the things that I always liked about Steamboat. It was, it was a small town, small town, but it had a lot of the, uh, the cultural and the, uh, uh, the enthusiasm that you have in a big city without <laughs> a lot of the big city things. Yeah. But it's 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 also interesting, and, it, and it's what brings people here is the small town community, and the small town atmosphere, uh, the closeness to the outdoors. And, but uh, it's amazing you get somebody comes and then they really think we need a little piece of the city brought over here. You know, they, their their special store, mm -hmm. their special whatever, and the rest of the community has to kind of uh, weigh that. It's whether or not, you know, and uh, whether we want a super mall here or or maybe we should not go that far. It's a big do, challenge right yeah, now. Do we need freeways? <laughs> do we need more stoplights? Or a Chili's <laughs> or a Target. And Absolutely. You know, it's it's yeah. all that cookie cutter, same mm -hmm. all, same all that tries to infiltrate. And we've been lucky, I think, in, in blocking some of those generic type things. But Well, and it's, and you have, you have, the community, you have to make it available, because if if it otherwise it ends up down the road, and you end up the end up the people that would support that just go there instead. Mm -hmm. So you have it's a trade off, balance. and and it and that's exactly it's it's a struggle for balance, and yeah and uh, it's it's always interesting. I used to live up in Strawberry Park, and it was interesting every time we get a new resident somebody build a house up there, the first thing they want to do is they want to organize the Strawberry Park group and what we got to do is we got to put up some rules and some laws and we've got to make sure nobody else can move into Strawberry Park. We don't want anybody to mess it up. Mm -hmm. And they and it's been a struggle that they've been working for, with for years and I think they've been pretty successful and but it's yeah, and you've got you've got part of the group that says hey we you know I've got this property and I want to I want to make some money with it you know it's my taxes are going up and if I Split it up, put a few houses on it. Can we interrupt this for a minute? <laughs> My wife. Well, Steamboat, one of the things that was really interesting about Steamboat, too, is uh, after I got here, it wasn't the winters that kept me here, it was the summers that kept me here in Steamboat. When I lived here, the summers I enjoyed immensely. And, it's, and I, I enjoy skiing, but, it's, but skiing make, makes winters bearable. And uh, it's, so it's, it's like the best of, of uh, all worlds. But the one thing about it, you, have, you need to be involved with something that is involved with winter, because winter is a long time in Steamboat. Uh, I'm really spoiled up uh, living up in Seattle now, uh, because we've got 
you've got snow on the mountains uh, just about, well, most of the year, and yet uh, it's, it's sunshine and uh, green, delightful there, but uh, it was definitely the summers that kept me in Steamboat, and I still, uh, I enjoyed, I enjoyed my time here. It was part of an adventure. I, w I would certainly would, uh, wouldn't uh, object to not being or being here again. And if that happens, who knows? We'll see. Well, thank but you it's, very much. It's, it's, it's a part. And I always want to be a part of it. And hopefully the Lighted Man will always be a part of it. I hope One it of is. those traditions that remains the same. Mm -hmm. I hope it is. Thank you so much for talking with us today. It's been my pleasure.